Hey everybody, my name is Aiden Mattis, I am joined by the Immaculate Wendigoon, and you are listening to the third installment of the Weird Bible Podcast, and if things hadn't gotten weird enough, we're going to talk about the time before there was time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what an introduction. I think that's the best way to put it. Um, you know, this is this is one of those concepts that I took, uh, I took an entire course in college, a, uh, a 400 level religious studies course. Uh, where we talked about wisdom of the Bible. It was like uh, Religious Studies 413, I think. Um, it was a 15-person class. It was entirely seminar discussion, like uh, like Socratic-style course. And we spent an entire week just discussing Chapter 1 of Genesis. And I did not <laughs> feel any more confident about Genesis after that week. Than I do right now, but, but, I am excited to get your opinion on some stuff, because I, I have a feeling that we come from slightly different religious backgrounds in terms of just, like, Christian sects. I, I grew a little up, bit. Yeah, I grew up in a kind of a lapsed Catholic family, um, and I believe you're Baptist? Yeah, but my, my entire family was, uh, like, definitive Southern, not Southern Baptist is in the convention of Southern Baptist, but like so, South Baptist United from States the South. Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> yes, correctly. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what, what Sunday school was like for you, but for me, it was, uh, it, it was very much the, the Catholic mainstream version of it, which is, you know, God creates heaven and the earth, he creates the animals, he creates Adam and Eve, and then, boom, we're done. Like, after that, Cain and Abel. Um, then we get the Garden of Eden. But, but there's not a ton that really gets discussed about it uh, in in the circles I grew up in. And so when I got to the point where I decided, you know what, I'm going to start investigating faith for myself. I'm going to start wondering, you know, I'm, I'm going to look into the Bible and really dig into it and see what I believe and what I what I can get from this. I found the Genesis creation story to be so much more complex. <laughs> um, and just this, uh, one of those things that you sit there and you read it and you're like, that's confusing and it doesn't match what I learned in science class. But then as you dig into it more and more, you start to read to it, there's, there's so many branching topics and so, much, so many layers to this. Even down to the fact that in the, the first couple of verses, uh, the word heavens is used with a lowercase h. And then the word heavens is used with a capital H. And you know, because if you've read the Bible, there, nothing is done by accident. Um, that's, a, that's a deliberate decision. So it's stuff like that that you pick up on, those little tiny bits that you're like, all right, well, there must be a reason for that. And often I've found that even like a study Bible, like that's supposed to be telling you, you know, what the context is, there's, there's points where it just doesn't have an explanation. And that's one of them. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, like for you, what was your upbringing with this and like, where did you, where did you net out on it? So growing up, I was definitely in the same boat of it's like, okay, here's the seven days of creation and then garden of Eden and Cain and Abel. Like it's all just mm -hmm. kind of one quickly glossed over, but that's how a lot of like Sunday school stuff's done in general. Um, it's kind of like uh, an example I was talking to a friend about the other day is like the golden rule. Mm -hmm. It's like the golden rule doesn't really work. Like, you know, do unto others as you would have them. Like if you were to be like, well, what if I want to smoke crack? Does that mean <laughs> make other people smoke crack? Like, I, but... mean, I don't know. Was... <laughs> Joe Biden's <But> America. It... <laughs> <laughs> I don't even Thank know you. what the political comment there would be. <laughs> Joe Biden is having people do crack. I don't know. Like, <laughs> Just continue. Yeah. Obama is forcing crack on our Sunday schools. <laughs> anyway, um, I don't even know where I was going. Oh, yeah. So it's like the golden rule. Like, obviously, you can like game it when you get older mm -hmm. with stuff like that. But it's enough that, you know, a child gets the idea. Oh, well, I wouldn't want someone to do that to me, so I won't do that. And the same goes with the way a lot of Sunday school lessons are taught to children. It's just kind of to get you by it. And whenever... I started searching for myself as I got older and started to do the whole golden rule thing. Like, what if I want to smoke crack? I was basically doing that with the whole Bible. <laughs> like, what if I put crack in it? Um, <laughs> it's going on a shirt. What if we put crack in the Bible? <laughs> what if I put crack? Just a picture of the Bible. What if I put crack in it? Um, use your face too. 
<laughs> it's gonna be like the night vision goggles and everything. It's gonna be it's gonna be like you like this with the night vision goggles on, and in one hand is the Bible, and in the other hand is crack. Huh? You know, sometimes <laughs> someone says something to me, and I can just imagine how it would be read on the five o'clock news. And that was one of them. Like just imagining them showing like he had his followers. He taught them that he was a religious figure, and it's me holding crack in the Bible. Uh, anyway, um, but as I got <laughs> as I got older and started asking it for myself, heavens was one of those questions. Because that's not the only place in the Bible that heavens is mentioned that way. Another place is whenever Paul is talking about he ascended to the third heaven, um, and I believe that one's a lowercase h as well. Mm -hmm. And it's just like things like that reoccurring. And the way I've always heard it described is heavens with the lowercase like that is the way they used to describe the sky. Mm -hmm. and that does make sense given a lot of the context. They talk about how um, there were palaces that reached to the heavens, like lowercase h. And they talked about um, how the stars were hung in the heavens, lowercase h. Mm -hmm. But then there was the uppercase h, which talked about like, you know, afterlife and all of that. So whenever I hear in... The book of Genesis, where it talks about the heavens were separated or divided from the heavens, I always thought of that as being like literally the sky was separated or like atmosphere as we know it was created right. um, and the world underneath it. And the same goes with a lot of that stuff in the book of Genesis. I think we talked on this podcast, maybe last episode, about how like the purpose of the Bible is to like forward the cause of Christ mm -hmm. and to save souls. And then all the information we get as Christians is secondary to that yes. goal. Uh, and I feel like a lot of this kind of stuff is along those lines. Like, it's one of those things where, like, yeah, it, uh, like, for one, the way Genesis opens is literally in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, which, like, that first verse. They really do just <laughs> toss you right into it. Like, there's, there's, just, there's no crap. Uh, <laughs> a, a weird thing that I noticed as I was, like, prepping for this that just occurred to me. I, I was reading through it and I was like, wait a second. I remember growing up feeling like there was a verse before that. It was kind of a, like a Mandela effect thing for me. I like I remember there being a, in the beginning there was nothing, and then God created the heavens and the earth, mm. and it's not there. <laughs> and it, it's really messing with my head. I'm like I remember oh, that being there. <laughs> Those Masons really did a number on you, didn't they? <laughs> you know that's that's the secret of Freemasonry is they they added uh, one verse. That doesn't change the meaning of the vibe, the Bible at all. <laughs> they added one verse that does nothing. <laughs> Honestly, it would be the greatest troll in in religious history. Just like you create this entire secret society, people think is running the world, and in reality, you're just adding like five words to the Bible. <laughs> Actually, reminds me, uh, there was a Spanish poet. I think he was a poet who used to get in duels. This is like 1500s. He would get in duels with other people over the works of Dante. Okay. Because he said, yeah, he'd be like, oh, no, in Divine Comedy, Dante meant this, or he meant this, and he had, like, all his own interpretations. And these fights would get to the point that he would get into, like, you know, uh, dueling matches over them. Mm -hmm. And he ended up killing, like, ten people in duels over this fight, and then on his deathbed confessed that he had never read Dante. <laughs> just like to argue <laughs> so so you're talking about religious trolls oh and that guy my came to mind. god <laughs> that's that's fantastic i that's like now my life goal is to find something i've never read or watched and make it my entire personality but back to the topic <laughs> anyway just so as, as I got, yeah, as I got older and as I started to reread things, um, one, th there were a couple of things that I wanted to figure out. A, is the, the account in Genesis reconcilable with what we know about the formation of the universe? Because obviously that's, that's a big point of contention. That was probably one of the first things I had to answer. Not because I was sitting there in church going, hmm, what would Newton think? But rather... <laughs> It was, kid. <laughs> it was more along the lines of, like, I got into high school, and you had the, you, you know, there's always the cringy atheist kid who, like, even when you're not, like, when you say, oh my god, and they're like, huh, I think you mean oh my nothing, like that guy. Um, <laughs> so there, we, we had one of those in our friend group, and he asked me a lot of questions like that, and I was sitting there, I was like, you know, I feel like I'm right, but you sound like you're right, so I want to be right. Um, 
<laughs> and I would sit there and, I, and I'd start reading through and trying to understand. I don't think it was really until I got to college and it was I was confronted with this idea that the creation account in Genesis is not a creation of um, necessarily the exact order in which things happened, but it was presented, and I, I don't know that I totally agree with this, but the way it was presented to me, and I thought that was, that it was fascinating, was that Genesis is not an account, or Genesis 1 is not an account of the exact chronological order, but the cosmological order. The order of, you know, varying, uh, you know, degrees of complexity and whatnot. Because what you get is day one is uh, God creates the lowercase heavens, the earth, lowercase, and light. Which separates, of course, from the darkness. One of the main uh, issues that people tend to have with Christianity is adopting a dualist perspective on it and believing that there is good and evil, there is light and dark, when in reality it's much better. In my opinion, I'll, I'm curious what you think about this. Um, in my opinion, the, the perspective is there is God and there is absence of God. There is light and there is absence of light. You had this entire conversation yeah. about a hell, right? Yeah. Remember we were talking about the concept of like, oh, sinners being flicked into hell or whatever. Yeah. Um, and how in like actuality, the Bible doesn't define it as that. It's instead defined as um, like there is God and then there is choosing to not be with God, mm -hmm. which is the absence of God, which is, you know, hell. And we had that whole conversation. But what's interesting is there is so much and I, you know this more than I do. There is so much like sort of crossbreeding between religions throughout mm -hmm. history <clears throat> to a near indistinguishable degree with some of it. Yeah. Now, I think the Bible is one of the more foundational in that aspect, but even it has had some details. Uh, I was, for, for a video I was doing, I was researching um, Slavic paganism. Mm -hmm. oh, and isn't it reading? <laughs> it's so it weird. confusing. <laughs> It's the weirdest stuff ever. It, it's like, um, it, it's exactly what you would expect from something that is directly east of Sweden. Like... <laughs> That's a good description of it, yeah. Uh, but, but while I was reading about that stuff, uh, it's, they have a, it's Bernabog, something bog, uh, and Chernabog, and they are a spirit of light and masculinity and a spirit of darkness and femininity. Mm -hmm. And, like, that's literally yin-yang. That yeah. is the exact same concept. Uh, well, and they talk about... I'm just excited you mentioned this, because I, I get to bring something <laughs> up. But, yeah, go on. Well, my, my point with that is, like, there you have a small, like, religion that seemingly has no direct connections with the yin-yang ideology that has the exact same beliefs. And a lot of people want to cross-apply that to everything. So whenever they look at something like the Bible, they apply that duality, that good, evil, you know, light, dark spirit to it. When, in my opinion, the Bible was made before those concepts ever came to be and the like concepts were set out. So I think some of that of viewing it just in lightness and darkness is kind of looking at it through a more modern or humanistic lens than it deserves. Yeah, so. I agree. Um, but I was, I was excited you brought it up because... Um, like I said to you before we went live, I, I, I did some digging into some other Middle Eastern religions. Ah. Um, and Zoroastrianism, which is <laughs> arguably, arguably as old as Judaism. Uh, it's, we don't know which one is actually older, we just know they're close. But Zoroastrianism, uh, in its extant form, is dated to the 6th century, which is also when uh, most of the Jewish, uh, older Jewish books are dated. Um... But in their story, uh, Azura Mazda, who is, the, who is existing in the light and the good, is the dualistic opposite. Uh, there is conversation about whether this is dualist or polytheist or Gnostic or what, but um, he is, he is the, the light and the good. And then Angria Mainu is the darkness and the ignorance. Not the evil. He is ignorance. Mm, um, interesting. And so there's this dualist perspective of these two these two beings that are in uh, in contest with each, with each other from the dawn of time. They exist separately and independently, but they are in constant conflict. And I can get in a little bit more to the the details of it later. But that also becomes even more interesting because um, first of all, it sounds a lot like the creation story from the Silmarillion by Tolkien. Um, but also, <laughs> also. You keep doing that. I know, I know. In my defense, he was a Catholic. Fair enough. Everything Fair enough. he wrote, man. Everything he wrote. 
Uh, but yeah, so there's this I uh, this this uh, the the light and the dark and um, and then they create as a, a Zora Mazda creates a uh, primordial human who is uh, by the name of let me find the the exact name again. Uh, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong. Uh, Gaiamard and his primordial bovine, the bull named uh, Gave Vodata. Now, in another creation story, there is Ymir, the giant, the Jotun, the primordial Jotun, and his cow, Ingeboda, I believe is the name. That's Norse mythology, which is very similar right. to the Zoroastrian mythology, and the Zoroastrian mythology is very, in- very linked to the Slavic and the Zoroastrian also has a flood myth, as does the Sumerian, as does basically everybody. But it's just, there's so much of this, there, these little details, you know, that you, you gotta, you gotta wonder, like, obviously some of these cultures weren't even linguistically connected. The, the Norse speak an Indo-European language and the Hebrews speak a uh, Semitic language and the, what are their, what are they called? The, uh. I guess the Iranians, obviously, the Zoroastrians have a have an Indo-European language as well, which mm-hmm. might be, which does bring the question: Does this story of the man and the cow predate those migrations and go back to the Yamanaya period when they were all on the steppe? But that's that's getting off topic. Mm. It's interesting. But so <laughs> cosmologically, back to that, <laughs> um, we we get day, cosmologically. Yeah, day one we get. Heaven, Earth, and Light. Day two, we get the firmament, or the expanse, which is this, uh, you know, just basically, it sounds, it sounds like a Big Bang. Um, which, <laughs> like, I, I've been saying for years that the Big Bang is not contradictory to the Bible at all, because God says, let there be light, and then there's an explosion. <laughs> but, <laughs> so... But in that, uh, the, the expanse, he, he calls the heavens in chapter 2. He said, it is said the expanse, he names the heavens, capital H. And I, I think that is that in and of itself is fascinating. But then we get uh, the, the part where this becomes weird. This is no longer just fun. This is now weird. Because <laughs> then we get that there are the waters beneath the firmament and the waters above the firmament, but the firmament is the expanse. The firmament is heaven, capital H. So there's waters above heaven and there's waters below heaven. And I'm going to be honest, this is something that I have struggled my entire life to understand, and I'm curious if you have thoughts on it. So <laughs> my thought with that has always... All right. <clears throat> so Old Testament. We understand that, especially during this time things of the spiritual realm interacted much more directly on earth. I mean, in the Garden of Eden, you know, God walked and talked with Adam and Eve. Like, it was a very direct one-to-one. And I think that potentially, like, geographically closer, but at least in a spiritual or contact sense, heaven was much closer to earth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the two interacted with each other frequently. Whenever it talks about the waters being above heaven, I have always thought of that being being a quite literal sort of bubble around heaven. Mm -hmm. So you know how like up until the flood, people lived for like eight, 900 years. Yeah. That was just like common. And then after the flood, it was like 120. Yeah. Very quickly decreases to like 120. Yes. So my theory with that, and I'm going to put on my biology. Noah Noah continues to live a very long time. Yes. Noah, Noah does continue to live a long time. Um, I think there's a reference that it says Noah was blessed, so his mm-hmm. seed would continue to grow or what have you. Because so again, he had a reason. From Lord of the Rings. <laughs> now I'm just doing it to annoy you. You keep doing that. <laughs> um, anyway, so during that time, gosh, you keep doing that. This is my train of thought. Um, Whenever there's, okay, so the primary idea for the reason people age the way that we do is through essentially um, like slow burn radiation Mm -hmm. from the sun because there's like radical particles and that causes our telomeres to shorten and that's the reason people age at the rate we do. So that's from UV radiation. If you were to put a giant bubble of water around the earth, 
theoretically, like the aging process would be slow to almost zilch. Yeah. And that would explain why people were able to live for so long. And during the flood, if you'll remember, it says that it had never rained before on Earth. Rain didn't exist. And everyone thought that Noah was stupid for saying mm. that water was going to fall from the sky. Right. So that means a couple things. That means, for one, the ecosystem, the plants, and we know that there's plants because Adam used to till the gardens and all of that. Um, all of those were able to exist without rainfall, which by our modern standards is impossible. Uh, or people it implies lived... a very moist environment or on a very moist soil. Correct, yes. Um, people lived much, much longer than they do now or after the flood and what have you. So my interpretation of it has always been that whenever it talks about that in creation, that there was water around the earth. There was water around the actual uh, earth itself, like a bubble or a ring or what have you. And because of that, that meant that people were able to live longer. UV wasn't as hard or whatever have you. Thankfully, God has made the universe with laws of physics that we can right. comprehend and not just random <laughs> science happening all the time. Um, it allowed people to live longer, and that oxygenated environment would allow for things like animals to grow larger or for plants to be able to grow and exist without needing rainfall or whatever. And then whenever the flood happens, and it's the first time that water comes from the sky, I think that firmament just crashed in on the earth. And all that water that was out there in the sky, which explains how there was enough water to fill the entire earth. Mm -hmm. um, for I th How long were they on the ark? Like 20 days and 40 nights. Oh, it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. I think they were yeah, on the yeah. ark for a little over a year. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're on there for like a year while the water settles. And like that would explain where all of that water, you know, came from at once. So I think whenever it talks about the firmament above the heavens, it's talking about that. And that was later destroyed during the flood. That's always been my interpretation of mm -hmm. it. Yeah, that's and and that's kind of what I've heard a lot about. And there is definitely scientific backing to the idea that a more tropical environment would allow things to grow larger, that it would allow people to live longer. We know that obviously we know that dinosaurs were absolutely massive. Um, you know, we've got, we've got the fossils. If you go to the Museum of Natural History in your local city, you're going to be able to see a T-Rex that is absolutely gigantic. And those weren't even the biggest things. Those are just, like, the coolest looking ones. Um, As a small side note, one of the funniest things is whenever, because this has happened frequently, I tell someone I'm a Christian in conversation, one of the first things they say is, oh, so you don't believe in dinosaurs? Right? right? No, I'm always like, who told you that? <laughs> Who there's, have you been talking to? There's like a small evangelical community that doesn't believe in dinosaurs, and people just assume that's all Christians, and I think it's really funny. Like, no, I, I can see the bones, man. They're there. Like, it's like 12 people. They're like, oh, so none of you believe in dinosaurs. Yeah. Well, I heard some guy on, you know, bible.gateway.fm say, like... <laughs> Um, I'm like, no, no, that's, it's, it's, I, I did get a, I got an argument. I wanted to talk about this towards the end of the show, but I'll bring it up now just because it's kind of topical. I got an argument on TikTok with somebody um, because there's, I, I'm sure you're aware of the deconstructionist movement. Uh, which one's that? It's I mean, I don't know name. okay. So there's there there's a few options here. There's it it begins it began as this idea of people mostly coming from evangelical backgrounds saying you know all right well what I was taught was this I'm going to go back and deconstruct it to try and understand oh, how oh, we got oh. here. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Yeah, yeah it yeah. was a, it's a originally I it was kind of and it was started by Christians who were like trying to bring people out of some of these more radical churches like Westboro Baptist and stuff like that and over time it it kind of got a little hijacked by the the militant atheist community of course not all atheists are militant I not only <laughs> atheists can be good people like I'm not one of those people who's like you have to be Christian to be a moral human being you don't um but <laughs> not all atheists are evil. <laughs> <laughs> but we got this argument where he's sitting this guy and and it was captain dadpool on on tiktok you know talking about how uh he's not going to send his kids to uh he like if his kids get invited to go to youth group or something he's not going to let them go because he doesn't want them going somewhere where they're being taught that they're evil from birth and i'm sitting there and i'm like what <laughs> what are you talking about what do you mean evil from birth and he's like uh original sin and i'm like 
that's not what original sin means. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And he's like, that's what most Christians think it means. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> Catholics don't believe that. Orthodox don't believe that. Lutherans don't believe that. Cops don't believe that. Like, what are you talking about? Like you and they you sit talk there. to two people. <laughs> yeah, they sit there and they will they will sit there and talk to an like an educated Christian, somebody who went to college and studied not only the religion, but also the history. And they'll sit there and they'll talk to you and tell you that you don't know what you believe. And I'm like, I, I'm pretty sure I know what I believe. Um, <laughs> how do you know what I believe? Uh, but that that bit is is important. And because that that is kind of the, I, I don't want to use that. It's the genesis of human society is. Uh, uh, I did the thing. And, yeah, I didn't mean to. I didn't want to. I like sat there and I was like, there's no way for me. No. Um, but because what happens is, you know, obviously... Uh, after day three, or after day four, I should say, which is stars, sun, moon, um, you get into day five when the literal translation, I just found this out as I was reading my interlinear, uh, the literal translation is not, um, the, like the, the creatures of the sea. It's that he, he, he tells the swarmers to swarm. The, the exact word is swarmers. Um, what? Yeah, but you can, what is a swarmer? <laughs> ask sixth century Jews. Um, <laughs> so we get the swarmers that begin to swarm, and then we get the uh, the birds, and then the whales. This is the order of things. Um, and then after that, on day six, we get the cattle and the things that creepeth, and then after the things that creepeth, finally. Um, we, we get the, the beasts of the land, the animals, and then mankind. And in, in that moment, that's when this goes from being a, a broad account to the story ends and we get chapter two. And chapter two is a much more intricate description of mankind and how it comes to be. And then chapter three is, of course, the fall. Uh, and, and in the fall, the original sin is, is not, everyone thinks it's eating the apple. Eating the apple is not the sin. Listening to the serpent is not the sin. The sin is defiance of God. The right. sin is, right. this is the first time in all of history that any anything, any one of God's earthly creations has defied him. And sin is simply to defy the will of God. It's not, it is not, it's not synonymous with evil. It's not synonymous with wrong. It's not synonymous with, like, you're going to hell. It's synonymous with absence of God defiance of god um and so that original sin is not that adam is suddenly evil and and they a lot of people will take this to to mean that christians are teaching children that they're they're evil and it's not that it's that we're all created via adam because we are all creations of adam in our own right because we're all his his descendants that we all have that sin within us and that it's not about striving to get rid of the sin it's striving to be better than original sin it's striving to put that behind us and to ascend past it rather than to allow it to bring us down and bring us away from god it's a constant struggle against innate urge to go against god not evil if that makes sense uh it's a discretion that i think a lot of people kind of skim over but yeah it does make sense that <clears throat> The reason the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or uh, the tree of life, was like I I've talked about this at nauseum in some of my weird videos. But like, the purpose of it was because without the existence of the tree, there is no choice for humanity. Um, if humanity was to exist as just another animal, as just a robot who was forced to walk and talk with God daily, if there was no out or defiance of that order, then there's no free will to it. Exactly. There's no choice. And in the end, <clears throat> we have no idea how long Adam and Eve were in that garden. Could have been a week, could have been hundreds of years. Um, but they decided to take of that apple and separate themselves from God to continue on the path of free will. And the ex like the purpose of existence afterwards for humanity is to readjust and return back to that communion with God. But yeah, the purpose of the apple was not that eating apples are bad. Uh, it, <laughs> it was that uh, choosing to separate yourself from the will of the creator um, has its consequences. 
That's like what the concept of original sin is, not the people bad. Exactly. It's not. It, and and I, I won't deny that there are absolutely churches out there that will tell you that you are born in sin, you are evil, and you are bad, and you must cleanse yourself and, and all that. But that's not, that's not what the book says. <laughs> like, and I think that people have gotten away from it in a very serious way. And I, I think that there, there are definitely a lot of people out there who do grow up hurting because they're put into this position where they're, they're getting a poor reading of the Bible. And, and, you know, I'm glad that we can kind of sit here and, and maybe for a lot of those people who see this, who grew up in that and they sit and they watch, you know, a program like this, hopefully they look at it and they're like, all right, so, you know, this is not a hateful thing. This is something that I, I was taught wrong. Um, because for me, like I was never taught that I was inherently evil. Um, and my, my stepdad's like a fire and brimstone Baptist. So like, I think it's an important d distinction to make, especially considering the, you know, the point of Genesis is to explain to us how everything comes to be. It is, it is, it's not just the beginning of Judaism. It's not just the beginning of, of history. It's, it's how the world as we know it and the structure of the world and that which is important to us. That's, it's how all of that kind of coagulated into something that was something that humans could understand and wrap our head, heads around. Um, you know, that's what's interesting to me about books like Genesis. Like, <clears throat> whenever you view it as, oh, yeah, this didn't, doesn't give a lot of information for the orders of how the stars were made or that, like, sure, it doesn't. But the purpose of Genesis is not to give us, you know, a direct breakdown of how everything came to be. The purpose of Genesis is chapters two and three. That if anyone has the question, why are we here? What is God? Then Genesis is direct to that. Genesis 1 is to set the stage for that, not to give us all the answers for exactly. everything. Um, like, I, I, there's a lot of questions I think do not will not be known until the afterlife, you know, the mind of God and what have you. But like for its purpose of explaining to us why we strive to follow the path of God, it does that job, which is what it's set out to do. Exactly. I'm, I'm sitting here trying to, like... Yeah, because it's it's fascinating. What we get is not um, it, Adam's age is not stated until they leave the garden. Mm. It is. Yep. It's he's one hundred and thirty years old when he has uh, Seth, and Cain and Abel are before yes, that. Yeah. But we don't get an idea of his. It, it it wouldn't make sense for him to age before he leaves the garden, because un God had no plan of killing them. God had yep. no plans of yep. death for humans. So so the concept of age is like one of these... The age and death is one of the first things that's brought to us by, by original sin, which I think is, is a fascinating concept that, you know, there, there was never a plan for that, you know? it was The plan was that Adam and Eve were going to just be God's buddies. Um, yep. And they were going to have wine night. Um, yeah. <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. Um, yeah, the, the purpose of Adam and Eve's original creation was for God, God sought companionship. And he sought companionship with man in a way the angels couldn't provide. Um, and I think it talks about this in my angels video, but like the concept of humanity having something the angels cannot obtain is fascinating and often looked over. Uh, like souls have infinite capability to become as evil or good as they want, but all of that lies within the realm of free will, and that's the reason that God created humanity, because you can't have a companion or a friend who is just a robot to what you say. Right. Instead, humanity uh, makes their own choices. And that gets into the whole question of, well, do angels have free will? And they have to to some extent, because Satan rebelled, or Lucifer rebelled, but uh, well, that's and a whole different whole Nephilim can of situation. Worms, yeah. And then, then, then the whole Nephilim situation and everything else. Um, um, but, like, Whenever, another thing that I think is overlooked a lot is the concept of death itself. Because whenever Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, uh, that was kicked out of the perfect one-to-one, -one, you know, a completely troubleless lifestyle. And that was pushed into a realm of free will where humanity's choices would affect humanity um, infinitely. And the purpose of death as it was set up, was not as a punishment or, like, a lights out. It was after you have done that, after you have chosen to, like, follow whatever path you will, either with God or the absence of God, once that is over, you will be able to reap the benefits of what you chose. Death is, in that sense, not necessarily a punishment. It is their return back to God after that's over and after they've created more people to do the same, and that's continued to this day. 
So death, as it stands, at least in my opinion, or in the Christian opinion, is not a punishment per se. It is the end of this stage as we return to the perfection or the garden with the creator. Exactly. Um, Which is the reason I cried like a baby during my uh, Purgatorio video, where at the end, Dante climbs to the top of Mount Purgatory, which is uh, I love all of that the it's sinners. Just Mount Purgatory. Like, <laughs> good job, Dante. Just, it really puts some thought into that one. It's just a mountain. It's just Mount Purgatory. <laughs> Mount <Monte> Purgatorio. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever, I hate you. Whenever he, uh, he finally gets to the end and he has passed all the sinners who are like earning their place mm -hmm. in creation. At the top of the mountain is the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Like the idea that it was always maintained for whenever humanity makes their way back to it. And in a sense, and as is described in the story of creation, that's what death is. The return to the garden, so to speak. Yes, exactly. Um, and I do like the idea, the concept that heaven is is Eden. And like, mm -hmm. that we are, that we're, that, like, when I, when you think about heaven and, and the idea and the concept and like, what, what do you want from it? It's, I, I don't think that, we can really grasp what it is until we're there. But the idea that it is a beautiful garden full of life where you spend eternity, you know, walking with God, that, that is like the most comforting afterlife I can imagine. Yeah. Just, just this return to nature and living in harmony with the universe rather than this constant struggle to survive every day. Um, it's also a lot cheerier than Ragnarok, um, where you know, <laughs> the whole world is destroyed by everything dies, fire and a flood. Uh, um, I, th I think um, honest, I keep going back to Dante's Inferno because I really like it. But one of the most comforting ideas that Dante had in Purgatorio is that every day God tends to the garden. Mm -hmm. prepares it for if humanity ever decides to come home, which is such a beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. Enough to make a grown man cry. No, right? Oh, it made me cry <laughs> on camera <laughs> a lot. Um, because the way it's described in the story, Dante's in the garden and he asks, what is this place? And the woman who's there says, every tree, every fruit, every blade of, gla every blade of grass is checked and attended by God every day. He wants to make sure it's perfect for if his children ever decide to come home. Like, oh. man, that just... Yeah, absolutely took me out. But you want to, and in the story, when Dante hears this, he breaks down yeah. and begins to cry. That, um, which it is a powerful it's a thought. Damn shame that the only part of that that you ever get to read in high school is Inferno, because yep. there's so like Dante's description of hell, while not canon, is I want to make that very abundantly <laughs> clear. Is not canon. <laughs> Um, everyone laughs when I use the term canon in relation to the Bible as if the word canon doesn't come from the Bible. I do the, like, I do the same thing. It's funny to hear someone else say this. Like, listen, we gotta get... Anime. There's, there's canon and there's legends. Um, <laughs> Enoch, is, Enoch is legends content. <laughs> Enoch is a legend. Um, describe, uh, this is now the Star Wars Bible podcast. Everything is going in Disney Star Wars terms. Um, oh, no. Yeah, right? Oh, God. <laughs> but I... Uh, oh, that's terrific. So, but yeah, there's so much beautiful imagery and description in it. But I, I want to get to uh, to the flood part of things because um, there's there's just such a, like... Oh, there's so much, but I'm, I'm just going to get back to my notes before I get ahead of myself. <laughs> so so I, I want to talk about before the flood, before all of this, because the flood changes the geography of the Earth considerably like we there are there are mountains that are now hills and there are valleys that are now seas and all of this so in genesis you get a description of where eden is we get that i uh, that when that, so god creates eden and he says it's eastward which is a little weird because what does that mean there is no northwest south or east yet we're <laughs> like unless I, I, god I, was talking about magnetism um, I, I, I like the idea of God being a fan of magnets. <laughs> well, he did invent them. He uh, did invent them. You know, just God, like, sitting in heaven just playing with magnets, and he's like, I should make people. <laughs> it's like, I need a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> like, click but, magnets. but so he creates Eden, 
and and what I've started to think about as I as I read this and as I take notes and I try to understand and I really try to internalize it. Um, this was this all was being written down by people. This so no matter what the actual process God was going through was, this story was written to be understood by people in the ancient world. So in in the you know immediate aftermath of the Bronze Age, um, and likely almost certainly before that through oral tradition, but the the first writings we have are from that period between the Bronze Age and the Classical Era. Um, and what we get is that God creates Eden eastward. So Eden is somehow east of wherever creation is, wherever or wherever the Jews are, where, wherever they're understanding things to be, or wherever the people who initially told this story were. So Eden is eastward. And then at the mouth of... It, it, God forms a, a river in Eden that flows out, and this splits into four more rivers. Two of these are recognizable. Two of them are, we don't know. But what we get is uh, the river Pison, which encompasses all of Havilah. Havilah seems to be betwixt Egypt and Assyria, uh, based on later things in the Bible, uh, the book of Samuel. Um, we get told that uh, the, it starts with an A, why am I blanking? Uh... Amalekites? No. Something like that. Uh, are you talking about one of the old enemies yeah. of the yeah. people of Israel? Yeah, but we're um, told they live in the, the desert of Nakab, Um which Ammonites. is... Mm-hmm. Wait, is, is it Ammonites? Probably that. That sounds right. Um, but, no, nah, it's not. Uh, <laughs> I, it's going to drive... I'm going to remember it as soon as we're done with this. Maybe chat will tell us. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they'll know. Uh, Amnon was one of the children of a lot, so it would have to be kind of later in the story. Yeah, it's... Uh, that's who it was. Well, so that's the thing, is we get... Here's where it becomes important, is because we're told about Havilah, this region, but we don't know... We're not told where that is. We're just told that that's where the river... <laughs> that, that the river encompassed this region. Later in the Bible, we get told about the people that live in the desert of, I think it's Nizreb, 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 or something like that in, uh, in Hebrew. And these people, so we, we get told about the people who, we get told about people, and we get told the people live there, and we know that there is in Havilah, which is a broader region. It seems to be somewhere between Egypt and Assyria, based on, you know, where this tribe of people lived. Then we have, uh, oh, and we also get told there's gold there. So, okay, interesting. After that, we get uh, Gihon, which uh, surrounds Ethiopia, or Kush. Um, Kush being this land south of Egypt. Uh, and again, got to remember that this is pre-flood, for those, for those listening. So things, uh, nations as we know them today were not present. Um, and this is also being written down before we get anything about Ham, um, and Shem, and, and, and all them. Uh so Gihon surrounds Ethiopia, and then we get the Tigris, east of Assyria, and the Euphrates. So what this is implying is that prior to the flood, these all were connected. Which gives us a, not quite the ability to triangulate the location of Eden, but it gives you a general idea that if a, a single river flowing out could connect all of these rivers then we know that Eden must have been somewhere in the Middle East. Right. Right? Yes. Yes, that also lines up with, like, where the first, like, civilizations in humanity was seen. Exactly. Um, and when Noah goes into the Ark, and the Ark eventually deposits itself, it deposits itself in the mountains of Ararat in Turkey, which actually is the current origin of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, uh, and then they go south, and that's when Samaria forms, essentially. Because um, we know that th this is where things were. Um, and uh, I can't remember exactly who goes where, but I know uh, Shem and Ham are sent to different places. Um, and Japheth is... It's, it's, Ham is the slave of Shem, and Japheth is subordinate to Shem, but not his slave, right? I'm getting that right. 
Were they? Did they become slaves to each other? Pull out the Bible. <laughs> it's, it's well, like while it's I, in the book yeah, while I do this, do you want to explain the the reason that Shem Ham and Noah had to, uh, or Shem Ham and Japheth had to do splitsies? So they were <clears throat> Ham, Shem, and Japheth, or Japheth, were uh, the three children of Noah. Uh, they, the three of them, along with their wives and Noah and his wife, were the only people who survived the flood. So, flood happens. Uh, humanity is essentially reset. It's down to them. And Ham, Sham, and Japheth, I know one of the reasons they separated is because God told them to begin to repopulate the world. But is there another reason I'm forgetting that they had to split up from each other? So they were going to split up to uh, go and, and repopulate the world. But there's a little incident where Noah has a little bit too much fun with the wine. And uh, Oh! Yeah. Yeah, I forget about that, because that's not mentioned in Sunday schools. Uh, no, it is not. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, Noah did remind what I do every that... Sunday, um, <laughs> which is drink too much wine and fall asleep naked in my tent. Um, <laughs> that is what he remind does. Uh, and Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth... Japheth? Japheth? I, I've always pronounced it Japheth. Either way. Yeah. Either way. Um, it's the Appalachia, Appalachia thing all over again. If I say Japheth, I'm a fan. <laughs> um, and Shem and Japheth uh, took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. I love how repetitive the Bible can be in these early stages. Like, it's just... I don't know why they... <laughs> why they wrote like that but well, i do enjoy there it. wasn't a lot go there wasn't a lot going on <laughs> it's, like, yeah, when, it's, it's like, like when you're almost to the word count um for the essay yeah, it's like <laughs> and he was naked and they were not naked and looked for naked and naked <laughs> and they unnaked him um like, they unnaked him. it's like reading a poorly seo optimized article um <laughs> and the keyword is naked uh <laughs> so and noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him and he said cursed be canaan a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren um and he said blessed be the lord god of shem and canaan shall be his servant god shall enlarge Jap japheth and he shall dwell in the tents of shem and canaan shall be his servant so we get this story of um you know i, I actually think the word slave is not used in the king james for obvious reasons um but uh <laughs> because the right translation um it, it drives me nuts that people are like the bible condones slavery and then in first corinthians paul's like uh yeah so uh slave traders <laughs> will not inherit the kingdom of god um <laughs> yeah it's in the uh, there's so many times when people take a verse out of context they're like see it says this and then you're like here's five verses that say that's not what that says well people people always do that i watched this guy on tiktok um who had a list he was like here's all the bible's contradictions and you could look at him and it was like uh this thing mentioned in exodus is you know destroyed in second corinthians it's like yeah because it was exodus <laughs> and corinthians These are literally 1500 <laughs> years apart uh, like, <laughs> some things that existed he, don't exist anymore like i was having that conversation with my girlfriend about um the whole, I think it was Cain's grandson who spilled his seed um, correctly. And like, because there's like religious sects to this day who think that's a sin uh, because of that one story. It's like that was one guy <laughs> where there was like seven people on exactly. earth. <laughs> Those <laughs> rules are not it was, a, it was a bit more of a more precious resource, if you know what I mean. Uh, uh... <laughs> that was much more important back then, yeah. And it's, and that's the thing that pops up a lot of times is people will be like, uh, why does God care if I wear two different fabrics at the same time? And it's like, that wasn't a rule because that was like wrong. It was a rule because there was obviously a reason for it. Like there was, it's like, don't eat, there's the, the do not eat cloven hoof thing. Yeah. Cause pork has, um, what, what's the parasite in pork? Trichinosis. Uh, yeah, bah, 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 bah. my girlfriend's a vet. I should know this. Uh. I know there's a parasite that's not good. There's yes. a parasite in your pork, or it's a bacteria, or it's something that if you don't cook pork properly, you're going to get sick. And so God's mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, don't eat that thing. And then by the time we get to Christ, cooking science had advanced a bit further. Um, so, 
and and so had the way they took care of animals. They were no longer you know just out in a random pasture. They kind of like controlled their feed and everything. So there was a bit more like when God gets up there and he's like, yeah, I mean the old law is important, but some of this is outdated. Like the ones that are outdated <laughs> are the ones that are like, don't eat pork. Um, don't wear two different yep. types of linen at the same time. It's those things. Shellfish. That are out, yeah. Shell. Exactly. Yep. Couldn't eat shellfish. Yep. So people always look at the look at it and they're like, you know, why? And because the, there were reasons back then that just are foreign to us that we wouldn't understand now. But back then, it probably made a lot of sense. You know, my guess is that when Moses came down, he was like, "You can't do these things." People were like, "You know what? That makes sense." <laughs> you know, my There's brother, also... my brother did eat some shellfish the other day and we buried him this morning so like <laughs> <laughs> i think this guy's on to something um there was <laughs> it's almost like he knows what he's talking about um there are also people who confuse the they hear that there's some religious groups who still follow certain rules and assume that applies to all mm-hmm. uh which i had to I explain this to a couple of people the other day but a lot of people probably don't know it the chief difference between judaism and christianity which there's a lot but the primary one is christianity believes that jesus christ was the son of god who came to be mm-hmm. the atonement for sins and judaism believes that he was not so therefore, Judaism does not accept the teachings of Christ. So the reason that Judas or Judaism, Judists, <laughs> Judas, I, I realized as soon as I said Judaism, the reason, Judaism, an unholy child. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the reason that they um, still follow those is because whenever Christ said you don't need to do this anymore, there's like new rules for the modern believer. They don't believe that, which is the reason they still follow the old rules. Um, which again, Christianity, who believes in Christ, thinks it's okay to like eat pork and shellfish, even though it wasn't okay, you know, back whenever that would kill you. <laughs> yeah, and then and then Islam is like Christ was a prophet, but don't listen to anything he said. Like... <laughs> That's really funny because I had that conversation with the guy one time. He was like, "Well, he was a prophet." I was like, well, "What was he right about?" He was like, "Not much." <laughs> like, okay, cool, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I love religion. It makes so much sense all the time. It really, it There's really never, does. never confusion. Nothing ever gets lost in translation. Um, T- talking to that guy, uh, his interpretation kind of sounded like Jesus was confused. Basically, they believe that, like they believe that he's like, well, he thought he was the son of God, but he was a little mistaken. You know, it makes it any better. He genuinely believed it. Like. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone in the chat did, did just say, in my religion, we don't eat Slim Jims after August. Right. You know, honestly, if Christ <laughs> came back and he said, don't eat Slim Jims after August, I would, I would, I would agree with him. I would say that's probably <laughs> not a good idea. I'd say maybe, maybe let's even be even more strict and just no Slim Jims at all. Uh, <laughs> do not look up what's I... in a Slim Jim. <laughs> I think if anyone told me not to eat Slim Jims after August, I would take them at their word. Yes. Because that's way too specific to not have a good reason for. Do, like, do they run out of the good parts in August? Like, <laughs> like what, what do you know about August, sir? What's going on? Yes. <laughs> anyway. People these days. Uh, but, yeah, so as, you know, we're about, we're about an hour into the show, so I want to I wanna swap over really quick to uh, the, the comparative... Um, religious study here, which is that, uh, you know, if we look at religions that sprung up around where Judaism sprung up, you know, the the people who were doing the same thing at the same time. And of course, interestingly enough, and I I hate the way this always gets talked about, but uh, the Canaanites did have a god known as Yahweh. Um, So, in my opinion, the Canaanites stole it from the Jews. Uh, there's a large sect of academics that want to say it's the other way around with no evidence whatsoever. Um, <laughs> Just get your head in while you can, man. Like, <laughs> there's a few people on TikTok I'm talking about. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> um, but if we look at the local creation stories, I actually haven't looked at the Canaanite one yet. I need to do that. Um, but theirs is very similar to the Phoenician because um, it's just the older version of it. And the Phoenicians were like, you know what would be cool? If we, if we stabbed and burned babies and then put a smiling mask on them, that would be sick. 
And then the Romans, who would put people to death in Colosseums by lion, were like, yo, that's pretty messed up. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yo, chill out. <laughs> like, the, Rom- the Romans go up to, to Britain and they're like, you know what? Um, these people uh, might burn people alive, but... <laughs> I mean, to each their own. And they go to Carthage and they're like, what is going on here? Like, like, you know it was messed up if that was the... Re- and we have sources from the Egyptians and the Greeks, too. And both of them are like, what are you doing? Like, what is going on here? Um, and we have it from the Jews as well. We have we have it from the Jews. Uh, people talk about... Uh, there's there's this uh, misconception that has kind of recently... We're, we're starting to understand what it might have meant. But there's these verses that say, say like, Give not your chi- your children to the fires of Moloch. Um, and a lot of people for a long time thought that this was a deity. But there's really no deity Moloch in any of the known pantheons from around the the Israelites. So the, the word itself, because there are no vowels in Hebrew or Phoenician, could also mean just sacrifice, a ritual of sacrifice in general, which could mean give not your children to the fires of sacrifice, don't sacrifice your children. And of course, one of the places that they would do these sacrifices to Baal, if they were idolaters, if they were Canaanite, uh, you know, part of the Canaanite pantheon, um, was they would they would perform these sacrifices in the Valley of Gehenna, which is what we talked about uh, in, in the last podcast. Uh, and that's part of the reason that they turned Gehenna into what it is, which is, you know, a, a dumpster, essentially, a giant landfill, because um, they didn't want people going out into Gehenna and committing sacrifices to Baal. Uh, but to, to move on to the Zoroastrianism, which is, of course, from Iran, so even further east than the Mesopotamians, their version of events is that you've got the, the light and the dark. You've got a, a, a Ahurza Mazda and Angria Mainyu. And uh, Azura Mazda creates uh, a high council, essentially, of beings, these seven <laughs> divine figures, um, who are his essentially his confidants. They're they're less than him, but they're they're still very powerful. And then you also get the Yazadas, which are just a slew of other semi-divine beings that are lesser than Ahurza Mazda, but greater than humans. Um, now this is very similar to the uh, Sumerian idea of their their version of demons. Um, as well as jinn, as well as the daimon of uh, Greek and Roman mythology, and there's even an Egyptian version of all of this. So one thing that comes out very early on, as I as I'm looking into this, is that basically everyone's got demons and angels, and they're all the same like strata. It's there between God and man. Um, now in the Zoroastrian story, we have uh, the uh, yeah they're the Amosha Spentas and the Yazadas, the Amosha Spentas being the seven, which you could almost say are akin to archangels um, in, in kind of the ideology here. They're, they're, the, the mo- they're like the seraphim. Uh, funny how that lines up. Yeah, it's exactly right. It's interesting how these people who were all in the same place at the same time all had similar ideas. Um, so so after, he creates, <laughs> after he creates the spiritual world, after uh, all this... Um, there is a 3,000 year split between the spiritual creation and the earthly creation, uh, the physical realm being brought into existence. And then we get Gamard and his cow, his, his, uh, his bull, um, <laughs> Gave Vodata, Gave Vodata, and, uh, the, the almost like satanic figure in this, who is Angria Mainyu just causes death and suffering and causes them a lot of problems, which, if you look into it, if you think about it, has a lot of similarities to a certain biblical book about a guy named Job. Um, what? That's crazy. No, no, they, they line yeah. up with each other? You mean other religions point back to one core religion? That's so weird. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, except in, in, in Judaism, they, he didn't kill Job. Um, he does kill uh, the, the dude and his cow. Um but then, then he does other things. So as as humanity sprouts from the seed of, uh, I'm going to get these names wrong every single time, Gaiamard, uh, humanity sprouts from, uh, uh, it literally his, his seed plants a tree. And from this tree sprout the first two humans, the first couple. Um, so it's a little bit different than Adam and Eve, but it still does start with a male and a female 
being created from something that grew in the earth, which, of course, Adam is created from the dust of the earth. God breathes life into him, and at that point, Adam becomes a being with a soul, the first human. Then we get, uh, after that, as uh, all, all the other beings go and, uh, you know, come out, all the animals and fish and everything, they come from the bowl. But the reaction is for the being of darkness, the essentially the god of darkness, to create opposites and create bad mm. versions of everything. Um, so he, he does that. And the one thing he can't match, and this is why he actually ends up uh, causing suffering and death to visit the, the human and the cow, is he can't mimic humans. He can't create something as perfect as humanity. So instead, he tries to destroy it. And in the end, ends up with a much broader problem. Now, this all precedes the Zoroastrian Apocalypse, which is a uh, event in which the world is covered with water and everyone goes and hides underground. Interesting. So, look it's not, look it's not the same. They line up again. <laughs> it's not the same, but it's very similar. Um, and of course, in uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, we get that there's a flood story from the Sumerians. And in their version, there's a guy who survived the flood. Because we don't actually get the, the, the flood happening. We just get, like, in Gilgamesh at least, we get, like, the aftermath. There's a guy who lives across the Sea of Death, um, whose name is Utnapishtim. And he's survived several hundred years after the flood. He's immortal at this point. Um, and you just, you sit there and you read that and you're like, that's Noah. Like... <laughs> like they, knew, yep. they knew about Noah um, so it's just it, it's very the, the whole thing is uh, I, I find to just be a fascinating mixture of, of tales and stories that you know obviously as a Christian I believe mine's right but <laughs> I believe that these people were all in one spot telling the same story of creation just it had got it had, you know diffused over time uh, that's just a I, I and I will say like when you think about it in terms of like religion does obviously there is a lot of uh, division and strife because of people having different fundamental belief systems but when you look back far enough we're all telling a very similar story and even if I think that you know Buddhists are wrong we probably at the end of the day have more in common than we don't so. I would um I agree with that, and that's one of the things that's been more encouraging to me uh, as I look into different religions, like for videos or just research in general or what have you, um, is that there are so many connecting lines between everything and so many things that, in my opinion, point back to what I consider to be, you know, my, the truth or a biblical foundation. Like, think about how many different religious beliefs have some kind of Leviathan. Mm -hmm. or some kind of giant dragon or serpent exactly. figure. And it, it, it like all goes to show, like you were talking about, whenever humanity was together, there were all these shared stories, like the flood myth or the Leviathan myth or what have you. And then as they expanded out, those became foundations of their own religions, but it all points back to one source. Yeah, it's... And it, it truly, like, I mean, it is the greatest story ever told. When you, when you go and you compile all of this, like, the... Obviously, a novelization of the Bible would probably not go over very well, but damn, it would be a cool read. Like, sure would. <laughs> if, if you could it pull sure it would. off in a way that wouldn't piss off half the world, um, it would be a really <laughs> cool book. Uh, you know, and and I do think that a lot of the people who are trying to make translations in newer English and everything are, are trying for that. But there's, I think you need to make it clear that you're what you're writing is a, a novelization and not a Bible. And I think, like, the New Living that's Translation kind of doesn't do a good job of differentiating between the two. That's one of the things that, like, I was talking uh, with my, my girlfriend about, uh, like, the story of... Uh, I did a video about him on my channel. 
Absalom, uh, and how that is such an inspiring story and like so incredible about like the boy who wanted to overtake David for the throne, mm -hmm. and like his uh, his own pride caught him, and like the his friend who like helped him get to his position was the one to kill him, and it's all these amazing stories that so many people look over because they're spoiled with it, and I think some of the beauty of the Bible is overlooked by people who just assume the entire thing is meant to preach at them or whatever, which is one of the reasons I love uh, having this channel and like this podcast mm -hmm. where we can talk about stuff like that. It's so cool to me. Um, and something that I want to do for future videos, because it is something I think a ton of people, pretty much everyone would be interested in some aspect of it. If they just knew that aspect existed. Yeah, it's, it, and it, it's, it's so nice to actually be able to sit down and talk about it and like, not have to worry about conventions or anything, like really explore it. And I feel like, like you know, this is this is what biblical conversation should be. I imagine this is kind of like what what people were sitting around doing in the early days. Those early church yeah. fathers were yeah. probably like, you know, all right. So here's my reading of it. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. Um, oh, what was it? In the uh, the 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 big meetings they had whenever they were trying to determine what uh, books in the Bible were canon or not. Yeah, the councils. Yeah, yeah this, this is pretty much what was happening at the councils. Yeah. Like, well, I think, you know, this far. Except, <laughs> except the Council of Nicaea, where it's still my favorite story, that, that St. Nicholas, that Santa Claus just just puts a beat down on Arius. Like, and, and, we don't talk about that. No, we, that's the fun thing. I was talking to, we had an Orthodox priest on the Lore Lodge podcast uh, back in November. And uh, he... We were sitting there talking about it. Me and him talked about it, and I was like, "So, so when you look at that, and you're like, you know, there's all the turn the other cheek, and you know, uh, be tolerant, and like, you know, restrained and be meek, and like meekness is is a virtue in Christianity. And the actual definition of meek is not the one that people go to. It's you know, to be restrained, not to be right. weak. Um, Correct. Yes. But, you cannot be. You cannot be a uh, peaceful man if you are not capable of violence. Exactly. Yes. Otherwise, okay. Okay, just Mr. harmless. Peterson. Yeah. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, that was a Peterson. Dang it. No, I didn't mean to do that. No. <laughs> Accidental <laughs> Peterson moment. This. <laughs> no. <laughs> this keeps now, happening. Now, listen, you have, to, you have to protect your father from the serpent in the underworld. Um, <laughs> I said that because Aiden Thornbury is in the in the chat right now. Uh, I know he loves that quote. I... Uh, yeah, but just, what was I talking about? You, you were talking about having an Orthodox priest. On yeah, right. I was, talk, to, I was talking you know, about when it. you're allowed to beat people up. Yeah, and I was like, so is that is that seen as, like, a mistake? Or, like, was that was that a bat? And he's like, oh, no, that was righteous anger. And I'm like, nice. Like, <laughs> man, yeah, I'm going to go, I'm I'm go slap a heretic right now. Um <laughs> probably shouldn't do that guys i'm not advocating for violence um just it's it's a fun story to to recount only when it's cool only when yeah. it's cool but as we are uh at now 8 40 p.m i want to throw it to a quick like 10 15 minute question and answer section um you know if anybody has questions i am going to go back to that uh we, we will answer super chats first but we will get to everything that we can get to by uh 8 55 i will say um, but I know, uh, Reynolds said something. He said, uh, okay, for $5, Ray tossed us, uh, a, okay, so now that we're near the end of the show, what have I missed? Which is very typical for Ray. <laughs> Hi, Ray. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. He never makes it on time. I, I love <laughs> he him, He shows though. up like when it's almost done. Exactly. Uh, he did ask what he missed. <laughs> I, I didn't see if anybody actually, like, responded, but... I'm gonna I'm gonna read through the chat a little bit here while we wait for anybody to uh, put some questions in. Um, oh boy, uh, somebody said yes, sir, Mr. Goon. I, I don't know what exactly they were referencing, but I like Mr. Whatever Goon. it was, thank you. I appreciate that. We got in all caps Giants because of course we do. It's um, my gang representing. We have Aiden in here, uh, just bringing up caves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aiden. <laughs> um, we have my stepfather who says uh, Moloch is a real thing. They would throw their babies on an iron statue. Moloch that was heated with fire and the babies were cooked to death. That was the old belief. Uh, what what is now being accepted is that the statue itself was probably not of a god Moloch, but it was probably of Baal or Tanit. And they were because we know from the Phoenicians later on, much later that they would sacrifice to those two gods. The child sacrifice was directed at those two gods. 
this is by no means the only disgusting Phoenician ritual practice. There are many others. Um, but that one's arguably the worst. Uh, I think that, you know, convincing people that in order to please the gods, they have to sacrifice their own infant child is, is pretty messed up. That's pretty high up there on the don't do yeah. list. Uh, Benjamin Smith brings up that Bohemian Grove still uses the idol. The Bohemian Grove one is a giant owl that they say represents wisdom, and they do sacrifice an effigy of a child to it. So I, I would say that it's is definitely it, in the same lane. Isn't that uh, isn't the Bohe- the owl like along the uh, line of Horus? Is that correct? Or is uh, something to do with that? Or Horus I is a remember? bull. Owl is usually Athena. Okay. Um, owls owls are associated with wisdom in most cultures. Um, yes, of, correct. Of the Levant. So. What else we have? Just standard whatever monster evil thing. Yeah. Um, let's see. Our elected representatives. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, just uh, high caliber individuals in our society going <laughs> to sacrifice a best. child effigy to a giant owl statue. And we only know this because Alex Jones got it on video, which is just like the most wild series of events. <laughs> uh so uh, one question that we have for two dollars from Douglas Ives: uh, Do you think dogs can be sexist to each other? Well, that's not really a biblical question. <laughs> but... that's a... <laughs> you just rolled off that. Well, that's not really in the Bible. <laughs> None of those words are in the Bible. <laughs> but I, I... They, they can't. They can be racist to each other. I remember that test. Oh yeah, my. Oh, there was a test. I was just saying, my dog only barks at huskies. Well, that too. They they did a test where like they took a bunch of like, like you know, chocolate labs and like they raised them together. Then they introduced like a golden retriever and they freaked out, or like a golden lab or whatever. It's just because if if they've never seen something before, of course they're gonna think it's weird. It's not that complicated. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my god, there was this. I was walking Archie, and there were other people out with dogs. And there was one one African American gentleman with a dog, and Archie starts barking, and I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh god, it's the the, the dog's a husky. That's what it is. But mm. I'm really worried about how this is going to turn out <laughs> like, socially. Like, I hope people don't think I, my dog is racist. I'm like, I'm like, tell him, like, I, I'm like, he really doesn't like huskies. <laughs> like, this is the end of my career. I'm about right to get now. canceled because <laughs> Archie can't contain his racism for huskies. <laughs> Um, so, I uh, KSIG Matt says, Hey, Wendigoon, I used one of your David videos to lead a youth group lesson. Oh, that's awesome. Wow, that makes me so happy. That's so cool. Thank you, dude, so much. That makes me feel great. Aw, thank you very much. There, there will be more, uh, Sunday studies next month. I have been booked up with, uh, videos from, like, advertisers and stuff, and that's been my focus. But next month, I'm taking a bit of a load off and I'm going to do Sunday studies and like slower on projects and stuff. So I will get back to that. But that means a lot. Thank you very much, dude. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. Uh, Reynold for $10. Thank you, Reynold. Uh, says, for a real question, this is all very interesting, but it seems taboo to talk about the mythology of Christianity. Where is a good starting point for this? I, I mean, I, I don't think it's, and I can definitely see how a lot of uh, <clears throat> church traditions would kind of make it taboo to talk about this in kind of a critical lens where you're like looking at it and you're not, not, I'm not, we're not questioning it. We're just like, you know, trying to fit the pieces together. I think it is okay to question it to some degree because that's what Jesus talked about with the Pharisees when they asked him, like the Pharisees were asking questions to Jesus and Peter said they shouldn't. And Jesus said it was fine. It holds up to criticism. Mm -hmm. And it's not like we're critiquing it or like calling it out for being wrong. It's, hey, here's a question about it. Let's see what it says. Because I wouldn't want to base my entire life and religion off of something that can't hold up to questioning. Um, And I think every question I've ever had with it, it has stood up to. And it has uh, supplied me with answers I didn't even know I needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think it's perfectly fine to, you know, question or ask questions more specifically about what it says. uh, Because it holds up to it. Yeah, and I think in terms of a starting point, um, you know, what I've done is just as I've as I've read the Bible and I've come to things where I'm like, you know, that seems like it might contradict science uh, or history or something like that. I'll just I'll take it. I will write it down. I will gather all the context I possibly can um, from the Bible itself. And then I'll go look at the, you know, the the what I what I perceive to be contradictions. 
And I'll try and find a way in which those contradictions aren't necessarily contradictions. Is there a way that this makes sense? And what I found every single time is that if you go back and you ask yourself, was this written to be understood by men? Or was this written to be wholly, completely, point for point, exactly what happened? And I think that you've got to remember that all of this was written to be understood by humans in a time period. So when, you know, when, when God says that he said, when we get that, like, God, God said, let there sprout growth, you know, was God literally speaking plants into existence or was God creating the chemical processes by which plants could exist? And I, I think that the latter is, is perfectly acceptable as an answer. I might be wrong. Maybe God did speak into existence, but that's kind of how I look at I, it. Is like, is there a reconciliation? I do think you're right because, like, the alternative I guess people want is that all the way back when the Bible was written, you know, like BC when the first parts of the Bible were coming out, he wanted them to be like, oh, well, this is where you know atmosphere and oxygenation and like hydrogen atoms come from. Like, what does that mean <laughs> to people at the time? And that's a good point because the word atom didn't exist when this was written down, like in any language. The, the concept did not exist. You could not explain what an atom was to people. Like, you could not explain yeah, what a molecule right. was. Honestly, you couldn't even really explain, like, how plants work. I think <laughs> if God ever... Atti- and this is the stuff like the mind of God, the stuff that I don't think will know the side of eternity. But if God was to speak directly and, like, accurately about everything that was made in creation and whatnot... I think it would destroy the minds of not only people at the time, but us now. Yeah. Because we still don't know everything that's exactly. out there. Uh, he does. Like, we, we look back at those people like, oh, idiots, you don't know what a molecule is. Meanwhile, God looks at us like <laughs> like we just know a page. Wait till you book. find about a, out about the Flark capacitor. Like, <laughs> God, God's up there doing his own thing. Like, Idiots! Uh, <laughs> so, uh, next question for 20 is from my stepdad, Christian. He says, evidence for a new belief about Moloch. It actually comes from the Carthaginians. Uh, We, for a long time, did not have much about the link between the two. We knew that the Carthaginians were a Phoenician colony. We knew that they had certain religious practices. But over time, as we've done more and more digging, the the phrase, give not your children to the fires of Moloch, um, it's, it's within that word, Moloch. We don't have any extant evidence of that being a god's name from the Canaanite religion. What we do have evidence of is that being a word for sacrifice, um, specifically sacrifice to Baal. So that's why the the belief is changing is because, you know, now now the question of is there a Moloch God, it, it's kind of a moot point because give not your children to the fires of Moloch, it doesn't matter if the God's name is Moloch or if the God is Baal. It doesn't matter which one of those two it is. What we're learning here is this is mostly a semantic argument between the two of them and we're just trying to figure out like the is that uh, it was i always found it interesting how like the statues of moloch directly like related to statues of baal mentioned in the bible exactly and i was like it's it, it, they're both like calves that they sacrifice people to and then the new information like oh it's the same thing that makes a lot of sense to me yeah because baal has you know he's depicted as having a certain horned visage um i'm trying to pull one up of him so i can pop it onto the screen um, okay, that's, that's Moloch. And every statue of Moloch, or depiction of Moloch, is from, like, the 13th century onward. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. like... <laughs> yeah, the, uh, and, like, for example, uh, there's this, there's a lot of depictions of him with a goat's head, not a, um, a, a bull's head. And the, the goat, the word, <laughs> one of the words that the ancient Hebrews would use for demon meant he goat so in a lot of cases this is just it it very much seems to be a a misunderstanding of words not necessarily um you know a a a lack of evidence that this thing existed but rather we just had the wrong word for it so is the is the moloch that people talk about a real god that was worshipped yes just not by that name um the, the name seems to be more in conjunction with the idea of sacrifice as a whole. Um, 
What else we got? Uh, J Dead says uh, for two dollars. Thank you, uh, Wendigoon. Any thoughts on writing a book? Uh, I've always wanted to write a novel. Um, as I do other writing projects, like I'm currently working on that movie with Evan Royalty, and uh, like is that an SCP writing... one? Uh, it is. That, well, I, we've already announced what it is, so I can tell. It's a Stalker movie. Uh, are you are you familiar with the Stalker video games? I haven't played them, but I've definitely heard of them. I, I, I want to play them. It'll be one of those. The movie will also work, so you don't need to know the games mm -hmm. to do it. It's just set within that universe. Um, but yeah, so uh, we're writing a Stalker movie right now. Um, that's actually in its later stages. There should be more announcements about mm -hmm. that soon. I'm excited. Um, but <laughs> as I do like writing projects like that, and obviously YouTube videos, that takes more of my time. But yes, I plan before I'm dead to make a book to some capacity. <laughs> I think people would enjoy it. Uh, let's see. Uh, in Genesis 1-2, what was the Spirit of God doing when it was hovering over the face of the waters? Uh, let me pull up. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of yes. the waters. Um, and God saw... The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think in the KJV, the word used is the deep. But it might... No, it is the waters. The deep is used before that. Um, let me see. I'll read the exact verse for people who the don't know. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Yeah. And the earth was up where we point. And darkness moved upon the face of the water. Hold up. Do you want me to just read it? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed that you were able to get it like the first bit right. I was sitting here like, I know it, but I'm not confident. Uh, I think I know the entire yeah. first part of that chapter, but go ahead. Do, do you want to try? Um, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Um, and yeah, go ahead. I'm not going to sit here. And, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So to give you what uh, what my study Bible says for this one, um, the earth was without form and void. Some understood a gap of an indeterminate period between verses 1 and 2 and translate became rather than was. Although the Hebrew word may mean became, as in 1926, the construction of the clause does not support a consecutive statement describing something that uh, happened subsequent to verse 1 and, but rather describing something included in verse 1, but. In other words, the initial creation was formless and empty, a condition soon remedied. Uh, the phrase means that at this point, God's creative activity upon the earth was yet unfashioned and uninhabited. The deep, not a reference to the mythological Babylonian monster Tiamat, as has been alleged, but simply waters. Moved upon, i.e. in the sense of protecting and participating in the creative work, the same Hebrew word is used for Deuteronomy 32.11. Um, so, in my opinion, that's, like... It, it, that's that's the big question here is is what were the waters I guess like because this is the, the <laughs> earth is without form and void and yet it has a deep and it has waters but we also know that the belief was that there is a, a sort of underworld that could also be referenced by the deep but the deep could also mean waters um, but clearly they're not saying that the because we as we know from you know the the rest of the book let me pull up the exact uh, order of things here the rest of the book. <laughs> Um, I accidentally scrolled to my section on homosexuality. Um, <laughs> not what we're talking you, about. You keep doing that. What? You keep just mentioning topics like. <laughs> this is how my brain works. Um, I know. I know. Just my notes are a mess. <laughs> but yeah. So I. Uh, so at this point, we have not gathered the waters into oceans. That is uh, day three. We have not constructed the, the firmament. That is day two. So God's face is upon the waters. The spirit of God is upon the waters before the waters really exist. So I don't... It could... Again, the purpose of it was to be understood by people. Uh, like the most basic definition I would give that is that life, water is life, water gives life to everything else on the planet, could quite literally mean that the spirit of God, life itself, was upon the waters, and life on earth could not exist without water. So that's just the spirit of life being injected and then put on earth. That's right. just it, what it could be, because I think a lot of it is meant to be viewed in capabilities like that. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things, that it's, it's definitely one of those parts that I sit here and I read it and I just do not understand. Um I'm not sure that I ever will. The Hebrew word is does translate directly to waters. Um, 
but you know it's another one of those instances where it's got to be something that was written so they'd understand it and i did see you know as i was prepping for this this podcast episode i was like i have no idea what this means um and i i, I really <laughs> wanted to get it but i just couldn't um my my only belief with all of this is that since this is all kind of before the the earth is created because as, as we know it's formless and void which means that it's the earth does not yet exist. The, the matter exists. The space exists. Um, and to me, I wonder, like, could, could you have explained back then to people that before the earth existed, the earth existed in its component parts? Um, so, you know, maybe this was a way of saying, like, it, yeah, it's just... That's a hard one. That's, you know, it's actually interesting when you think about the way it's worded, because it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. So the order of events is earth created, but it doesn't have its form yet. So perhaps that's just saying that everything was laid out, and then the seven days of creation is him forming the pieces together. That's kind of the way I view time. it. And, yeah, you know, so... It like whenever it's talking about that, it could be like the water being put into its place, the land being put into its place, and what have you, like being assembled as of sorts. Kind of like how God created man, where he just took the dust of the earth, put man together, then breathed life into him. Exactly. Could be the same idea with the waters, just placing it into place, his form of life on them, and then yeah, from there. It could be the I mean, we could be describing the creation of carbon and hydrogen for all I know, like you know. Yeah. Right? yeah. I had to get created at some point. So. Exactly. You know, it's what we've got here is you know, the, the very first... Because that is one way that I kind of do interpret this is like, what are the three component parts of, of existence? It's like space, matter, and light. And those are the first three things that get created. So I, and that's that's kind of how I've, how I've looked at it. Is like God's not yet... Cre- Obviously, God has not yet created Earth. Like, in its it, as we know it, as a round ball of dirt. But he is creating the component parts. And I wonder if, you know, the mm-hmm. way... The way they might have looked at this at the time, heaven can be synonymous with air, earth, dirt, water, water. I'm not sure what light would be, if not just light. But as we know, the, the Greeks believed that there were four primary elements that were earth, water, wind, and fire. Um, so it could be something along those lines. I mean, I don't have a certain answer, but that's that's the best I can do. And maybe one day some other corollary piece of writing will be discovered that clarifies that or otherwise we're probably not going to know until we're up there um you know, there. <laughs> i'm going to start wrapping this up because we have a couple more questions and i just want to get through them before we go uh cassius sejuru sejuro says uh pretenders, thank you he was thinking like an artist who sits in front of an easel all his paints and brushes laid out in front of him he sat there and envisioned it all i've been captivated by captivated by this for a while that's also a good way to think about it i like that like the idea that he's created all of his implements, all of his tools, and that's him sitting there looking at it and like thinking how he's going to put it together. I do like that idea as well. Uh, it, it goes back to that idea of God being like the careful painter or tiller of the ground, so to speak. Um, yeah, I like that idea. It's pretty much what I've uh, like. That goes along with the idea of like all the pieces being laid out and then yeah. being formed over creation. It makes sense to me. Yeah, I like that version. Um, it also says in the Bible that you know man can never know the mind of God. So here we are being the idiots <laughs> running around in circles <laughs> let's see what else do we have? we have another one from christian that says why did god say that when he created adam he said it was not good that is in a version i've read and i can't find it in here so i'm wondering where the hell it went uh i think that is probably where it says that he found it not good that man should be alone yeah, that's what it was. So he made so he made Eve. Yeah, as that's... the partner to man. Yeah, I think it's I think it's one of the translations I read says that it's you know and he saw that it was not not good, or good. like that. But my interlinear <laughs> and my KJV don't say that. But I do think that's what he means is that he creates Adam, and he sees that Adam is good. There's no problems with Adam, but Adam it, it actually does say that he tells Adam to find a helper, and Adam goes to all the animals, and can't find any that are worthy as a companion. Um, and so God says, oh, well, I'll make you another person. And he creates Eve to obviously be the, the companion to Adam because, and this is one of those moments where we get something along the lines of like, it's balance that he's creating. He's creating it. it he's created man. Man has certain attributes. Adam has probably his own flaws and God creates Eve to counterbalance Adam. 
um, because man and woman are best when they balance each other out in Christian uh, theology. I don't know if you have a different opinion. No, no, yeah, that's good. That's <laughs> very nice. <laughs> Christian suggests that heavens equal existence, light equals time, and earth equals matter. Um, which, I mean, you, yeah, you could perceive light as time, considering it is the limit of how fast something can move. I do think, uh, we're getting into weird physics now, uh, I, do, <laughs> I do think that, let me make sure I say this right, Time is a boundary that I do believe was created for us to better understand experience and information and knowledge. I don't know how much time applies to God, if at all. I don't think it does. Um, I don't think it does either. So because of that, um, I feel that, yeah, probably. Like when light's created, that would be along the same idea of time being created. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you there. There's also uh, just, just an interesting factor there. Uh, darkness in a lot of cultures is associated with um stepping outside of time is it now yeah uh especially irish culture um if you go uh through the sea uh which is underground usually there are these things called fairy mounds you have to go underground to get into them you step out of the light into the darkness and then you can travel through time uh in a lot of their mythology which i think is interesting and then uh the zoroastrians when they were escaping the flood um then their version of it, humanity went underground. Uh, so this whole concept of be using underground to get out of time is uh, is very prevalent throughout world cultures. Um, I don't know what to do with this information, but I'll do something. <laughs> it's just food for thought. Huh? I'm happy if you want. If you want to know more about that, we can talk about it like privately sometime because it's it's fascinating, but it's dense. Um, it's some dense stuff. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, all right, and then uh, we do have one last question I want to get to, and that'll be the last one. Uh, from Coffee Lover Joel, I too love coffee. Um, heard that men and women don't understand each other because of the fallen world. Is that true? Um, I don't agree with that, that taking. I don't, I don't think that's uh, directly mentioned anywhere. I think, there's, as a matter of fact, it talks about that, like in the New Testament, whenever man and women bond in marriage, that they are to be one spirit, one mind, uh, and that God even views them as one, uh, like in, when it comes to judgment and yeah. all of that. So I don't think that that is like the not understandings anywhere biblical. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. It's the idea of two people being seen as one or becoming one together. Yeah. Um, I don't think, yeah that there's anything can you think of anything that has to do with men and women separating or like not understanding no i mean for the most part it seems that i, I mean from the very beginning of creation man and woman are created to be partners um mm -hmm. and to balance each other out so i think that that's you know I, I don't think and i also don't think that men and women necessarily don't understand each other um i think that in the modern world we definitely see it that way but that's because the way that we view uh, gender relationships has changed so considerably but you know a long time ago when, when you know you got to remember the gender roles exist for evolutionary purposes um as we've escaped the need for adaptation and surviving in a very very harsh world uh the the specific roles of gender have become very malleable so back then i mean if you look at you know several thousand years ago there probably wasn't that much tension between men and women because each was serving a very vital critical role in the survival of the other today as things have, as you know men and women have become very independent of one another economically um we no longer really think about it the same way there's now a, a more of a emotional dependency than there is a natural need for survival between the two um, you know, for better or for worse. But I think that, I, I think that the reason that men and women have trouble to understand each other is men and women and, and human culture, not, uh, original sin. I agree. Uh, I think as a matter of fact, it says in the Bible that God is not the author of confusion. Um, and instead confusion is a lack of knowledge of God or a lack of connection to God. So I do think that people have become just not, not just men and women, but just people in general have become um, 
it's become harder and harder for people to understand each other or everyone has their own ideas and ideologies that separate themselves from other people. And I believe all of that is apart from God. Because God, Since God is not the author of confusion, confusion is the lack of God. So because of that, I feel the closer that people are drawn to God, the closer they're drawn to each other. So I would actually see it the other way around, not that because of the fall, um, you, like you, men and women can't understand each other. I think it's because of humanity sin a lot of the times we can't understand each other. Yeah. It's because it's because we're we're not in a state of grace. We're we're you know constantly striving to be better. And to go back to what I said earlier in the podcast, no sin is not evil. Huh? <laughs> you are not, it goes full you are not evil for your existence. You are you are imperfect. You are imperfectly existing and that is okay as long as you strive to be better. That's that is the message here is that you know, it's a, the, the idea that, and I think this is lost on a lot of people, um, probably because of the way Christianity has been preached for so long. I think it's, it's comforting to me that it is not my fault that I am imperfect. Mm. It's comforting to me that I, that God does not expect me to be as good as Christ. It's, it's it's nice it's a, a comforting feeling that i have room to make mistakes and i have room to grow and as long as i recognize my mistakes as long as i make an effort to be better i will be welcomed that's that's a comforting thought i always think about uh christ on the cross like as he is being murdered by people forgiving the murderer. Look, yeah yeah for one forgiving the murderer hanging next to him but he looks up to god and says father forgive them for they know not what they do like and like it, not just infinite mercy, but even to the people who are actively killing him, recognizing that they are humans. And because of that, they are not perfect and they do make mistakes. That is like the, uh, that's the thesis throughout the entire Bible. Yeah. Like God, for, God forgiving and loving humanity in spite of humanity. Agreed. With that said, I think that's a good message to, uh, to end the show on. Thank you so much to everybody who stopped by to watch. We'll be back with another episode in about a month. Um, so hopefully we will have a good topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you so much to everybody. Isaiah, thank you as always. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, enjoyed it as always. All right. Have a good night, guys.